was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes thought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. <clears throat> and being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint me my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. As you uh, can tell from the scripture today, we're moving towards the, the end, the Passion Week. Judas is in motion. And, and uh, this transition passage we're going to look at today between all the stuff about the future and the, the pa upcoming Passion is really important because it sets before us a great comparison that hopefully if we look, look our, at ourselves in the mirror, we'll see our, our, our reflection in one of these two characters in this, in this passage. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to uh, bless our time together. Father, once again, we come to your word and ask God that, that you would teach us. Your, your promise is that your spirit would lead us into all truth. And so, God, we desire that to happen today. We pray that anything that might deter us from that, any distractions in our hearts or in our minds, uh, God, you would take care of that. We would be able to put those aside so we could hear from your spirit clearly as, God, you desire to change us more and more into the image of the one who died for us. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So let me start today just by asking a, you guys a question and asking myself the same question. It's this. Have you ever in your life shown Jesus in some practical way an extravagant outpouring of love? An extravagant outpouring of some sort of sacrifice? Can you recall in your life a time when you gave Jesus something that really cost you? something. A time when you maybe went without something so that you could give Jesus something else, so you could sacrifice for him. Was there ever a time in your life when you did that? Because when I ask myself that question, I don't really like the answer I give back. Um, shouldn't we expect followers of Jesus Christ not to hesitate to worship him in extravagant ways and with great sacrifice. Shouldn't that be our response, considering the great salvation we have? And so in this passage, what we have is two lives that stand in contrast with each other. There really couldn't be a greater uh, contrast. We have a, a woman that gave her best and a man named Judas who betrays the Son of God. Of the woman, Jesus said later on in the passage, whenever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman will be done will be told in memory of her. And of the man, Jesus said, it would have been better for this man if he was never born. And so we had this great contrast being set up. So let's kind of dive into this and look at some of the principles here between the woman and Judas in the passages. They're contrasting and compared. The first thing we need to notice is clear here. Our love for Jesus must be public. There's no such thing as a private follower of Jesus Christ. It, it demands a public outcry of some sort. Read the passage again, verses 1 through 3. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. The chief priests and the leaders of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, that's Jesus, 
reclined at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. And so the backdrop of the story is the Feast of Passover, a time when um, Jewish people were giving thanksgiving to God for their, their freedom from uh, Egypt, their bondage to them for many, many years. And they, so the backdrop is the idea of freedom from slavery, freedom from the oppressor. And here's Jesus coming right at that time to present himself to the people, but they don't get the connection just yet. Meanwhile, in the shadows of secrecy, the Sanhedrin, the, the chief priest that teaches the law, they're seeking to arrest Jesus, to kill him, to get rid of him. And um, Mark says that they, they hope to arrest him literally in a treacherous way. They were looking for some sort of treacherous, treacherous. They weren't looking for the law. They weren't looking for a way. They weren't really looking for a blasphemy to uphold the name of God. They were scheming. They were trying to find out a way to trap Jesus but not until after the feast because they didn't want a riot on their hands. They didn't want their name to be dragged in the mud. They wanted things to go smoothly. So they were scheming to do it secretly. Um, and basically um, what they wanted to do is get it to a point where they could stack the crowds against Jesus, right? That's eventually what happens, right? Everybody's praising Jesus as he comes in on Palm Sunday, but later on they're yelling, he's crucified. So they're looking for the right timing so they could stack the crowds and public opinion against Jesus. But no matter what they did, and this has always, always comforted me, comforted me, no matter what they did, no matter what their scheming was, no matter what their plans were, things would proceed on God's timetable. And Jesus would be crucified, the Passover lamb would be crucified at the exact time he was supposed to be in the exact way that God uh, saw fit. And so despite all human scheming, Jesus is still moving forward to the plan to, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. At that point, the scene, the scene shifts to Bethany, a town just outside of Jerusalem. It's Simon's home. According to Matthew 26, Jesus had healed him from leprosy, according to Matthew. So he's going to a home of a, of a man who had just healed of leprosy. According to John's gospel, the unknown lady in Mark's gospel is unknown, is actually Mary. John names her. It's Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So Simon might have been their father. He was the son or grandfather. Just think what that family has just gone through. You know, Lazarus dies, resurrected. Simon has leprosy and and he's healed. So it's uh, pretty, they, they're seeing some pretty amazing things, right? And so Mary has seen some pretty amazing things, as well as Judas has seen some pretty amazing things as well. So the scripture says, so Jesus is reclined at the table. You recline in the, in the ancient world. You didn't eat in a dining on a chair. You lay down. You reclined when you ate. That was pretty typical. Mary comes in with a jar of expensive nard, and she pours it on Jesus' head. Nard, if you don't know, a spike nard, which the planet comes from, is this sweet-smelling perfume. It's rare. Still is pretty rare today. When you see nard in the stores, like in health stores, it's American spike nard, not the nard that's here. This type of nard only comes from the Himalayan mountains in Nepal and China and India. So any, the only place you could get this plant for this, this spice, this perfume, was in the Himalayan mountains, very, very far from ancient Palestine. So it's very, very expensive. And so Mary took the flask and she broke it. Um, it's no longer usable. If you can't catch anything dripping off Jesus' head and feet, and as John tells us, she poured the full contents out on Jesus. Everything, the broken jar, is her full commitment to Jesus and pouring all of that expensive perfume. Uh, a couple things are going on here. Normally, a woman would never approach a man, even in this sort of setting, unless it was to serve him food. But Mary approaches him without food. Mary approaches him to give, give him an extravagant outpouring of love and sacrifice. Mary could care less about the cultural conventions of her day when it came in conflict with her devotion to Jesus. So she didn't care if she was supposed to or not supposed to approach Jesus. She was so devoted to him that all the cultural conventions went away. She came to him to give him this great sacrifice. Jesus was her Lord and her master. She deeply loved him and would have done anything for him as the story continues to show. She broke every rule in order to give of extravagant love to her Lord. 
She wanted everyone to know by this act of the great value she placed on Jesus. So she publicly, in front of her whole family and probably other people who had gathered there for that meal, went to Jesus and publicly showed her devotion in this extravagant way. She just didn't say, Jesus, I love you. She didn't just say, give him a high or give him a nice meal. She poured out expensive nard upon his head. No one could deny where her trust and her loyalty lay. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, the, the scripture says nard costs 300 denarii. That's a year's wages. So on average, the average typical American wage is 50 grand. What Mary just took was 50 grand and poured it out on Jesus. She sacrificed everything for him, maybe even her future. That might have been part of her dowry for marriage. She might have even given him all of her dreams and hopes. This is an extravagant outpouring of love. Our love for Jesus in the same way it must be public and show full commitment. Otherwise, we're just the people in the crowd. This is what Mary did. She didn't just go public with cultural Christianity. Mary went public with some things you could see and sink your teeth into, and no one had a doubt. No one doubted where her heart was. No one wondered if she had a divided heart. No one wondered if she was following Jesus fully. They saw her commitment was 100%. Given that, Number two, our love for Jesus will cause some people to ridicule us. If we have that sort of love for Jesus, expect to be made fun of. Expect to be misunderstood. Expect to be maligned. Verse 4, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. So some began to talk among themselves. They were indignant. They didn't like how she was using her own money. And according to John, the ringleader of that whole group was none other than Judas himself. And so Judas is studying in his self-righteous pride. Uh, they questioned both her motive and her action. Both things they're upset at, her motive and her action. It was a year's wages. And this is self-righteous. They, really they didn't really care, by the way. They were indignant. It was, was self-righteous. It was a year's wages. When was the last time you or I did something like that for the Lord? If I look at a time in my life when that was possible and I could do it, and it's never happened, to be honest with you. I've never done anything like Mary does here. And it's convicting. For Judas, what she did was unheard of. Who would do something like that? And the answer is, the person that will do something like that is someone who values Jesus above everything else. That's who would do something like that. Dan Aiken, uh, a theologian, uh, writes these things about the situation. This is not me, this is Dan Aiken, but I think these things are right on target. So let me read what he says. This, the first thing he says is this. The disciples in this situation not only demeaned the woman, they also demeaned Jesus. Think about it. To honor Christ in this manner, they said, was a waste. Jesus doesn't deserve that. The poor do. They didn't believe he was worthy of that extravagant sacrifice. That, that's telling. They thought other things were more important than Jesus, and Jesus has to set them straight. Uh, Dan Aiken also says, some are willing to be poor in their possessions in order to be rich in their devotion to Jesus. That's Mary. Others are not, and the latter are usually the critics. And I, I find that so true. The people that criticize other Christians, if you were to look at their life, it's sometimes worse than the one they're criticized. It's, it's the plank and the, and the speck in the eye syndrome that each one of us runs into, um, if we're honest. And the third thing Danny can say is the world, and sadly, many in the church, 
will never have a problem with moderate, measured devotion to Christ. We're okay with that, right? We're okay with that. If you have some moderate, don't, don't rock the boat. Everybody can use a little bit of spirituality, right? Don't go overboard with this stuff. Don't be extravagant. Just let people know that you're a Christian. You love Jesus. Um, if you want to pursue possessions, if you want to pursue comfortable, convenient Christianity, as long as you show up in church and go to a Bible study once in a while and read your Bible, you're good to go. And that's not what Mary's heart is at all, is it? She's far beyond that. You see, if you walk away from a real career, quote, like the air quotes from that real quote, career, you are marked as foolish. You are marked as, as wasting your life if you do it for the gospel. If you walk away from mom and dad to serve the Lord in the inner city, for example, in America someplace, among the poor and the hurting, then you'll be deemed silly and impractical. You have the smocks. Be a doctor. Go do that, right? Uh, you'll, if you walk away from family and friends to head out to the mission field among the unreached peoples, and by the way, there are still 7,000 unreached people groups that still have not yet heard the gospel, and you take maybe your small children, your family with you, maybe some of your children aren't that healthy, and you do that, then you are reckless, and you are radical, and you are imbalanced, and maybe even you need to see a counselor. And I've heard people in churches say that to their kids who desire to follow the Lord at a deeper level. You see, if you follow Jesus radically, if you take him at his word, you will be ridiculed and treated as if you are crazy or uneducated in the real ways of life. And I find that said in the church, not this church, other church, a whole lot. That, hey, 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 a little bit of Jesus here, not a whole lot of Jesus. Calm it down. You're making people feel guilty. I'm not responsible for how you feel if I live my life following Jesus, and neither are you. That's on them. Right? Now, if you're trying to make people guilty, it's a whole different story. But the point is, you follow Jesus. You follow Jesus 100%. That's what Mary is doing here. And so, yes, you're going to be criticized. But in heaven, you have a master who applauds you. You have a master who is cheering for you. And he might be the only one. But you have to decide if it's worth it. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 1.10. For am I now trying to win the favor of people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. You see the choice there? Two choices. You either be holding to people or you're a slave for Jesus. A slave means the master owns everything, even the $5,000 bottle of nard. You must choose follow Jesus, all of him or none of him. And as we learned before, Jesus seeks followers, not fans. All of him or none of him. Here's why. Point three. Our acts of love for Jesus differentiate us from the fans. Look what Jesus says in defense of Mary, verse six. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so we see Jesus standing up for another faithful servant. The disciples didn't do it. They're the ones involved in the yapping and the demeaning of Jesus and of her. This woman has showered on him a sacrifice that, of extravagant, extravagant love that are ridiculed by faithful people. People that have, no, the disciples did miracles in Jesus' name, and yet they're ridiculing one who is sacrificing for Jesus. Leave her alone. Jesus. This is like tell when someone's poking the dog or something. You know, it's, it's kind of this. The tone isn't like, "Hey guys, just stop that." It's like it's a command. It's like, "What are you doing? What's what's? Where's your mind? Leave her alone." And and uh, they're harassing her. They're giving her a hard time. 
And what Jesus sees in her is something of great, great importance. He sees her heart. Some readers, uh, I think, misread verse 7. Uh, they think that Jesus is insensitive toward the poor, towards the poor. Oh, you always have poor. Don't worry about that. That's not what he's saying. We should do good for the poor. Remember, Scripture, interpret Scripture. Throughout the, the Bible, Jesus talks about the poor, and we should help them. And, and the Scriptures are about Christians being advocates for those who are poor and disenfranchised. The issue here is between the words always and not always. You'll always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me with you. So the poor are always there, but Jesus will not be always there. He's going to be taken away. He's going to be sacrificed. The opportunity to show him this kind of personal, practical love and affection would soon be gone. And, G and Mary is the epitome of what it means to devote one's life to Jesus in the moment with everything that you have. And, and the other sidelight here is, that, again, Jesus is God. We don't ever forget that. And the first great command always trumps the second great command. Love the Lord your God before you love your neighbor as yourself, right? So God always comes before. So yeah, the poor, poor are important. And, and see, what Jesus does here is say something very clear that he's going to be leaving. He just talked about his crucifixion and his death. If you put these words in my mouth or in anybody, any other human person's mouth, that the poor will always be with you, but I won't always be with you, what it comes across as is it's a scandal, right? What is he talking about? It's narcissistic. It's self-centered. From anybody else's mouth, that's how that would come across. But you put them in the mouth of Jesus, who, for your sake, became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. From his mouth, it makes perfect sense. So the point is this. We care for the poor, but we worship the Savior. Don't confuse the important for the most important. I think a lot of that is happening in the church today. We're confusing important things. We're spending a lot of time on important things while neglecting the most important. So what does Jesus see in Mary? Two quick qualities. The first one is this. What Jesus sees in Mary's heart is full devotion. He says this, she has done what she could. What that really means is she held nothing back. That she didn't try to figure out how to cut corners and show devotion to Jesus. She went right to the best and she did everything she could with her, her, her income, her, her limit, her love, her family, her influence, whatever she had, whatever resources were, she done, she did what she could. Full devotion, not the divided heart, not partial devotion, not no, no compromise in this woman's life at all. The other thing that I think he sees in her is full commitment to God's plans. Her act of love has this prophetic and symbolic significance. Jesus says, she has anointed my body in advance for burial. Did Mary fully understand what was about to happen, that Jesus was going to be crucified? Probably probably not. But did she have a greater insight into the Lord's coming passion and suffering than the 12 disciples did? Yeah, I think she did. I think this woman had an idea what was going to be happening while the, the other disciples were walking around like Neanderthals, not knowing what was going on. They were confused all the time. But she, I think she might have had an idea. And so Jesus... What, what she's doing here, she's committed. She is anointing him for his passion. She understood God's plans were moving forward, and Jesus saw that in her, that her heart was not about her plans and maybe that nard being part of her dowry and her future, her marriage, her family. She put those things aside, and now she's saying, your plans, Jesus, that's what matters. And so that's what she saw in him. Jesus makes this promise after that that, her love will never be forgotten, and as the gospel advances through the whole world, that that story would be shared. And the proof is, I'm doing it right now, right? And this sermon has been preached over and over and over again throughout the centuries, where her name and her life and her act go down in history as the, as the example for you and I to show love to Jesus. And then we have um, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. 
they were delighted to hear this and they promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And notice that word watch connected to the previous passages. We're supposed to watch for Jesus' coming and watch for the, for the coming of the kingdom. Judas is watching too, right? But he's not watching for the sake of the kingdom. Judas is watching for the sake of himself. You see, some people, they find Jesus useful because of what they think they can get from him. Others find Jesus beautiful because they get him. The end, period. And Judas is the first guy. So Jesus, this woman found Jesus beautiful, worthy, of great value. She gave him everything she had. In contrast, Judas found Jesus useful. And he sought to get everything he could in exchange for him. Judas was one of the twelve. So close to Jesus, but yet he missed him. And so, amazingly, Judas, after this incident, takes the initiative. And he goes to the chief priest to hand Jesus over to him. And from other Gospels, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, the Scripture says that Satan moved to betray him, right? Satan moved in Judas' life. It doesn't get Judas off the hook. Just because Satan moves you to do something doesn't mean you have to say yes, right? Judas gave in. And Judas said yes. Judas had free will to say no, but he didn't. And so verse 11 is simple and tragic all at once. The leaders of the Sanhedrin were delighted. They were delighted to hear, and they promised Judas money. From other passages, you know, that was 30 pieces of silver for Jesus. 30 pieces of silver is an insignificant amount for the life of a human being. He was considered insignificant. So the fact that Jesus is not highly regarded by Judas and he sold him for a cheap amount of money is reflected not only in his betrayal, but also in the low sum that Judas agreed to take. He took pennies, comparatively, for the life of Jesus. Mary poured out $50,000 in our money to Jesus. Judas poured out a couple bucks, was given a couple bucks for Jesus. So here's the application. I want to look at the contrast. In your outlines, there's a contrast there. Notice what's going on in this passage kind of visually. We have Mary, a woman, in that, in that day and age, had, has no real standing, no power whatsoever. We have Judas, number one, he's a man, automatic standing, and he's one of the apostles, one of the trusted 12. Mary gave what she could to Jesus, everything she had. Um, Judas took what he could get from Jesus and made sure he was handling the, the, the bank account as well. Mary blessed her Lord. Judas betrayed his Lord. Mary obviously loved her Lord. Judas used Jesus for his own personal gain. Mary did something that was beautiful for Jesus, and Judas did something that was terrible, betrayed the Son of God. Mary is serving him like he is the Savior, which he is, and Judas sold him like he was his own slave to be bought and sold. Mary, notable forever for her devotion to Jesus, whereas Judas is notorious forever because of his betrayal. There's an obvious comparison going on. And before we point fingers at Judas and say, what a bad guy, let it be known that sadly, probably you and I are good at giving our leftovers and our hand-me-downs to Jesus, too. We're good at trying to get Jesus to give us things. If we just analyze our prayer life, we often use Jesus rather than bless Jesus. And, and in doing so, we demonstrate how much we really esteem him. I served a church once where the youth center was filled with old, worn-out couches and chairs. We just started this youth center, and uh, the people in our church had bought new couches for their homes, new chairs for their homes, and they donated the old worn out couches of the church in the process. They got a tax break and uh, they felt like they had done something good and notable. And in their defense, it was I who asked them to consider that. Donate your old stuff and get some new stuff and for yourself and donate the stuff to the youth center so we can get this youth center started. Now, I, I wonder if I led them astray. Had they really done something noble in doing that? 
In essence, I think I was teaching people, if it's no longer worthy of being in your house, give it to Jesus. What does that really say? Give it to Jesus if it's too ratty, too worn out for your house. My wife and I were in another situation raising uh, support in uh, the ch one of the churches we were trying to raise support in had um, a missionary, not us, was going to China and they were doing this old style drive to collect tea bags for them. Guess what kind of tea bags they were asking for? Used tea bags. You can't go out because you would use it, instead of throwing your tea bag out once, right? You can give it to the missionary so they can use their tea, the tea bag a second. And you do two, get one cup out of it. You know, so you just donate the stuff that you don't use to Jesus and to the mission rather than going out and spending, what, what's a box of tea cost? Two bucks, right? And, and unfortunately, this happens all the time in the church and in your life, in my life. I long... I long to be like Mary. But how often does Judas appear in our lives? Get up in the morning, look in the mirror, plan our day, look at our checkbooks, look at our time, look at our resource, look at our families, look at our vacation time, and more often than not, it's Jesus looking back, Judas looking back at me and telling me how to organize those things. Let's be honest, there is a Judas in every single one of us, self-serving, holding things back from Jesus when he deserves our all. It's only the cross of Christ that can cure our double-minded, twisted souls. That's where the hope lies. It's not striving to be more like Mary and less like Jesus. It's not trying to be a better person by being more like Mary than not being a bad person like Judas. It's, it's all about trusting Jesus more and his work on the cross so he can transform my heart just like he transformed Mary's. That's where the hope lies. Let me close with this. Make no mistake, the biggest difference between Mary and Judas was the condition of their hearts, not the actions of their hands. If we don't let Jesus into our lives to transform us, if we're always keeping him at arm's distance, we're never gonna show extravagant love when we need to. We're never gonna be the people that give everything for the sake of the gospel, our Lord, and the mission. We're simply gonna try to change our behavior and constantly fail at it because behavior modification is not what the church needs. Transformed hearts is what the church needs. Let's pray. Father, I, I am uh, so convicted with this passage because, uh, God, I, I see Judas everywhere I look in my life. Um, I am a wretched man, just like Paul said, but thanks be to God who in Christ has made me new and makes that offer to anyone. Father, I want my heart to be transformed more and more. I know the people sitting out here today want the same thing. We want our hearts to be, become softened, to become more like Mary's. That we don't even think twice about giving you, God, what you deserve. That there is no internal struggle between what we should and shouldn't do and how much we should give or how much we should serve or or anything that has to do with ministry. Father, we, we want our hearts to be transformed so we just act out of our love for you. Father, change us, we pray. Convict us if that's what needs to happen first. God, open our eyes to the things that we are blind to, that we might be the people that come to you and pour out blessing upon your head over and over and over again. No matter who ridicules us, no matter who, who sees us uh, silly and uninformed Father our number one job is to give you all in our worship and in our hearts we pray all these things in Jesus name
Amen.